Okay, we're back here live at the Open Compute Summit in uh, Silicon Valley in San Jose, heart of Silicon Valley. Uh, this is where the innovation is happening. This is the future of the data center, the future of the cloud. Uh, this is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the advanced extract a signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, founder of SiliconANGLE, which is my co-host Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org. And our next guest is Gary Orenstein, CMO of Fusion IO, CUBE alum, um, innovator. Um, been on theCUBE, I mean, eight times, zillion times, uh, back again. Uh, to break it down Challenging for us. Pat Gelsinger's record. Um, <laughs> break it down, uh, Gary, because what's happening, you know, we were on our crowd chat earlier, you're on Twitter, we're, we're all talking, watching the keynotes. Uh, I was comparing this to, to be like, if the homebrew computer club was modern, this is what, what they would be doing. Trying to get the components together, get more performance, get that holy grail, which is essentially the future, which is cloud, right? And the application tsunami we're seeing Facebook and this, what you guys call hyperscale, um, has set the standard. They built an infrastructure for themselves, and that's what Bill Atkins said about the Mac 30th birthday party. We built the Mac for ourselves, and that changed the entire world from that point forward. Obviously, it's legendary Steve Jobs and his team did that. Are we in that Mac moment right now where they're building the world for themselves? It's a great time to be participating at OCP. Uh, you know, every year it keeps getting bigger. The, the fun part now, I, I think, is the just the, as the ecosystem keeps growing, it's becoming easier and easier for people to participate. Participate by contributing ideas or designs or participate by acquiring OCP technologies that can be easily deployed in their data center. Uh, Frank Frankowski spent uh, several minutes this morning in his keynote talking about the solution providers who are taking the concepts of OCP and making them digestible and easy to consume for customers. Uh, today, at, uh, uh, you know, at Fusion IO, we issued some news with two of these solutions providers that we're working with. Hive Solutions is one, Quanta Computer is another. And as an example, from Hive or Quanta, you can buy fully integrated OCP solutions that include Fusion IO flash memory. <coughs> so this is just one example of the ways that it's, in my opinion, really working its way into the mainstream. Today, we also saw new customers coming in to participate in OCP. So Box.com uh, now joining the roster. They talked about Riot Games, Goldman Sachs, Bloomberg, why, Orange, why, others. Why, why is it, but why is all the excitement? I mean, I <laughs> want to really get into this because I think at a root level, there's a big picture around, you have a lot of distinct parties here, diverse parties, motivated around the trend. You got OpenStack kind of on one side, you got the you know, hardware geeks on the other. You just right. had JR Rivers from Cumulus, yep. which is essentially kind of like VMware, <laughs> software defined, or you know, Linux yeah. networking. So uh, the uh, representative from AMAX, Julia Shi, I think at one point in her talk said, you know, anybody who has a few racks of servers is a great candidate for OCP. And what's the thing that keeps anybody who has a few racks of servers together is how do I squeeze efficiency out of that? You know, you can talk about how many servers do I have or how many software licenses do I have or should I have more, should I have less? Everybody wants, maybe besides the real estate companies, everybody wants a smaller data center to be more efficient and to be more effective, serve more compute power with less equipment and less energy. And so I think what we're seeing now is that this mission of openness is really what has been defined as a great way to get to this level of efficiency. So to me, as the open compute mission expands, sure, open is great and is a wonderful vehicle for helping accelerate these things more quickly than they could ever happen before. But the payday, and we heard, uh, I think it was Jay Perico said that Facebook over the duration estimates that they've saved $1.2 billion. It's the payday of the efficiency that is really, I think, going to keep this flywheel turning more and more. Cole, Cole Crawford talked about um, the OCP is not pay to play, it's kind of reward to play. I wonder if you could talk about some of the contributions you guys, uh, Fusion IO, are making to the initiative. Absolutely, well last year at Open Compute, we announced our IO scale product, which is taking all of the core IO memory technology that Fusion IO has developed over the years with some of the world's largest customers and global data centers all across the planet. And we made that accessible to the world through the introduction of our IO scale product. We also contributed the design of that product to OCP, so that specification is available on the OCP website. And then between last year and this show, 
uh, we also worked with OCP on a software project uh, that we call Open NVM, Open Non-Volatile Memory. And it's the first software project uh, in Open Compute. It's also referenced from the Open Compute project page. And in that project are a collection of technologies designed to use Flash in a way that it can best be exploited from an efficiency point of view. How can we s squeeze every last bit of efficiency and every last uh, you know, dollar of value out of the flash memory. And so some examples of technologies that are in that uh, open NVM software initiative include atomic rights for MySQL, which we've talked about, and we're now working with uh, a number of companies in the MySQL community to make that happen. Other technologies include a, a native key value store for flash, which can be used as a plug-in for popular databases. And another piece of the technology equation in there is something that we call the uh, the advanced swap, basically the uh, swap function for Linux, making that flash aware. So all of these software initiatives as part of this open NVM umbrella share the same mission of we have this new media called flash memory, it's a focus for Fusion IO, and beyond just designing great performing and highly reliable hardware products, how can we use software all the way up and down the stack uh, to make that more efficient? What's your take on the, um, on the on the processor vendors? I mean, obviously you're in the middle of that. You get ARM. I saw ARM is here. AMD is here. Intel is here. You have new players like I/O here, just you know, taking the world by storm. I mean, the keynote pretty much blew everybody away, um, and you guys sit right in the middle of all this action. Yeah. Um, what's it like? I mean, what do you see around you? What you know? We're trying to read the tea leaves here. What's next for the customer? Yeah. Well, I think the. the the great news for the customer is that as more people get involved with open compute, it becomes easier for them to participate. So you don't necessarily have to be a server engineering expert uh, in-house or have a server engineering expert in-house if you want to participate in all the goodness of OCP. You could call Hive Solutions, you could call Quanta and literally dial up a rack of, uh, or multiple racks of servers with, with flash memory inside. On the processor equation, I do think it's fascinating that we're seeing the whole spectrum of solutions and of course the group hug initiative, uh, you know, common socket interface for the, uh, the motherboards, it's an OCP project. Regardless of the processor choice that uh, customers want to use, and they're all good and they all serve different reasons, uh, you know, the uh, uh, ability to use uh, new processor technologies com combined with new storage technologies, new flash memory technologies in, in a very efficient easy to consume package being an, you know, an OCP configuration, uh, that, I think that's just goodness for all end users, whether they be hyperscale focused or enterprise focused. So I, I want to ask you about a, uh, your, your quote on Twitter, but first I want to get your comment to George Sleshman's quote. He said, if people don't see open compute coming, they will be run over by it. As he was programming virtual machines running OpenStack on open compute on yeah. his iPhone on stage. Yeah, you um, know, and the fun part about that comment is he goes through this whole online demo of spinning up uh, virtual machine instances and then reminded everybody that there were no license fees uh, in that process, which he was very proud although of. Although J.R. Rivers from Cumulus pointed out that he's buying a boatload of networking boxes. <laughs> of course. tax built in, not a license you know, fee. I, most of us don't se. build our own house, okay, so it's so, good to get some people involved so, so to help we're out. Hold, we're going to just point that out <laughs> to George. And he's going to be like, oh, Ferry, you got me on that one. Um, so that's interesting. The, the, so the, it, we do see this running over people they don't, if they don't wake up to this concept, this yeah. paradigm shift. Yeah. And then you made a comment on Twitter. You said that the hyperscale is bleeding over to the enterprise. Could you expand on those two points? What are people need to be looking for before they get run over to? What is hyperscale bleeding over to the enterprise mean? So I think the best analogy of hyperscale bleeding over to the enterprise is what we saw with Linux. When, when, we, when Linux came about, you know, there was, people looked at it with disdain, it's not uh, mission critical, it'll never work in enterprise environments, and lo and behold now, just about every major enterprise is multi-operating system environment and they have large Windows installations, they have large Linux installations, they have, still have Unix installations, they still have mainframe installations, but Linux cemented its place as a significant uh, deployment operating system for, for enterprises and that didn't happen overnight, it took a number of years. I think we're seeing similar things with hyperscale architectures, these scale-out architectures where you, can, you, you, know, you add servers because uh, that's the best way to do it for these environments. For example, when you're deploying MySQL, 
Uh, you're not necessarily paying a huge fee for an additional MySQL license. You might be paying to support that additional server, but most of the MySQL deployments uh, fit a scale-out model. And just like enterprises looked over their shoulder at some of the web companies deploying Linux and said, boy, that seems like a, a good idea, maybe not for everything that we do, but certainly for some areas, I think we're seeing that now where uh, enterprises are saying, gee, we, we're going to keep a number of this, uh, or a fair portion of this compute power in-house. We'd like to lower our costs. We'd like to be more efficient. Uh, it seems like these folks know how to build large-scale applications at a relative cost. Let's you know, get our feet wet in there. And so I just think that we're going to see more and more of that over time goes on, uh, as time goes on, of enterprises adopting these uh, sort of pre-configured OCP what, packages for certain workloads. So what mile marker, a word we both like to hurt use, but let, just take me through that because the inhibitors that Dave and I were talking about earlier on the cube here and also on our last event was, it's kind of complex for the enterprises, the regular, the regular enterprises, not the, the unique black swans or unicorns, whatever you want to call them, the ones that like Facebook that do their own thing, huge customers right. for themselves. The normal enterprise, guys who are, you know, rack and stack and storage drives, EMCs, NetApps, et cetera, you know, these guys have been dealing with the, the, the operating plan of the past 20 years. Right. So what do they need to do? Is it automation? What's some, what well, do you Well, I think, I think the place for them to start is to call some of these solution providers that are focusing on, on building and selling OCP platforms. So Hive Solutions is a great one. Uh, Quant is a great one. There are many others that are mentioned today. And uh, these providers are, very uh, excited and very capable to work with customers and help them do the deployments uh, for you know, popular applications that suit the, the OCP architecture. So I don't think that was the case a couple of years ago. I think a couple of years ago, you, you did have to have some of the server experts and server automation experts in-house. Um, you know, one of the items that we heard today helping with the automation is uh, Microsoft, including their contributions, not only some of the designs that they've worked on, from a hardware perspective, but some of the software tools that they've developed to manage their multi-billion uh, people that they service with a variety of cloud computing architectures. So there's still, I'm sure, is work to be done at that management layer to make the consumption easier. Uh, I think we've certainly crossed a threshold of making the acquisition of open compute uh, hardware and software solutions. Uh, that part is done and now it'll only get, get better for customers. I saw Insuk Ray earlier, he's a VC at Rembrandt uh, Ventures, also was one of the guys at Loud Cloud with Andreessen and Horowitz, big cloud guy. He's probably going to be pissed at me for kind of calling him out like that because <laughs> the VC doesn't know he's hunting for good, farming for good deals, hunting and farming for deals. Uh, but I saw him walking with a big time financial services uh, company, won't say their name. Um, I want to ask you the same kind of question is the adoption. I mean. Obviously the financial services guys are in that same boat as Facebook where they got to do their own thing. I mean, they have to innovate. The innovation strategies for these companies are significantly peaked on I.O., they're peaked on latency, they're peaked on you know, cost structures as well. I mean, yeah, we saw Facebook, power. power. I mean, Facebook just produced data that says they saved $1.2 billion in savings over three years. I mean, that's not chump change, that's significant bank. Right, that's big right. dough, right? So, so these financial services, what are you seeing in those early adopter profile customers? So Similar? we are seeing continued interest in enterprise customers to how we can help them do more <clears throat> with less infrastructure. Either capture more data, process more data, query more data, uh, present more analytics. We've heard a lot of talk today about you know, the new applications, it was the gentleman uh, I believe from Merck, uh, Mr. Jim Lyons, Lyons yeah. yeah, who said you know, one of the things that they're spending a lot of time looking at is what are the new analytical models that we'll be able to do to move drug discovery and other things in the healthcare initiative forward and recognizing that that will take a significant amount of compute power. Now we need to know, okay, if we're going to do that with a significant amount of compute power, how do we keep our costs down? How do we keep our energy consumption down and open compute is on the leading edge of that. Uh, Jay from uh, Facebook mentioned earlier that at times they're seeing a 1.04 power uh, efficiency rating on their data center, which really is unheard of. Uh, the, the white paper that Facebook released last year on efficiency uh, details that 
but it also covers what they're doing to you know, shrink the workload on the, uh, how much data the apps consume, but also shrink the amount of infrastructure. So when it gets back to you know, what, what's next for these enterprises, they're gonna look and see, wow, if, if a company like Facebook can get a 1.04 uh, PUE number, and, and the industry average is significantly higher than that, well, they, they, they can't sit on the sidelines for long, Otherwise, they'll be run over. They'll be run over as we, as we well, learned earlier the, the, today. There are headwinds. I mean, the average enterprise app is you know, almost two decades old, but it seemed like my takeaway from the panel that we did this morning in Jim Lyons was like, you know, we're not going to worry about those apps. We're going to focus on these new workloads like analytics, and that's going to go there, and eventually it's just going to tip the scales. Exactly. Do you see it that way? I, you no, know, I think certainly enterprises will look to, if they're going to deploy open compute, I don't think it's a matter of you know, ripping out a whole bunch of prior infrastructure that was running classic apps like Oracle and SQL Server and porting those over to the new open compute platform, but they might take a look and say, hey, we're going to use some of these new data stores like MongoDB or Cassandra or, or, or Hadoop and, and run some analytics there. And since we're starting that one as a greenfield opportunity, let's look at this, these new hardware platforms and maybe that those uh, initial applications start more of in a in, a, in an offline uh, capacity for reporting and analytics as opposed to a real-time capacity and they can work their way there. And so there's a whole bunch of options that I think work well for enterprise customers that they can work open compute hardware and software combinations into their uh, critical path step by step. Well, it's interesting because your application space is qu pretty broad. I mean, you're extending yeah. the life of a lot of Oracle apps. And at the same time, you've always been uh, a player in the hyperscale Correct. Business. And then hyperscale, as we talked about, bleeds into the, the enterprise. Um, so the qu my question is, are we going to sort of hit an equilibrium? Um, will there be that tipping point? What do you think? Well, if you look at it in terms of the number of servers deployed, obviously the, the uh, customer concentration count, if you include uh, you know, the, the, some of the big players who are up on the screen, you know, there's a smaller number of players deploying a huge volume of servers. So uh, I think now what will happen is we'll see more and more customers that can get started because there are options available from service providers. Uh, going back to Julia's comment, if you have a rack or two or three of servers, you should consider uh, OCP. Doesn't mean you have to like flip overnight and do it, but that's about the scale that we're talking about now where it could make sense for people given that you can dial up a rack of OCP servers from one of these trusted solution providers. Yeah. What do you think about the um, Microsoft news, Gary? I want to get your perspective on that. There was some commentary going on, on Twitter. Obviously, they're donating some, some uh, spec, and yeah. it's just licensing it. So, real honest um, uh, effort by Microsoft to be involved. I mean, as Dave and I were talking privately before we came on, it's like, you know, you, you either want to be at the table or rather than on the menu. You know what I'm saying? As the expression right. goes. Right. So, um, that's really what it's all about. I mean, Microsoft has a seat at the table at something big, not, and that's not their forte hardware, but they've spent money on op, CapEx, OpEx yeah. for their infrastructure. And, so and Amazon's clearly not sharing its server design. Yeah, there are a few yeah. companies that are, that are so absent. Good move for Microsoft, a seat at the I table, what's great, your take on this? I think it's a great move for Microsoft, and you know, they do some hardware very, very well. Uh, Xbox, as an example. I don't happen to have one, but. I do, uh, two. There you go, there you go. so you know how well they do in hardware. You know, I, saw, I just saw that news today and I sat through the Microsoft uh, president. I think it's phenomenal. I think Microsoft brings a set of capabilities to this group that didn't exist prior, which is how do we scale the adoption of technologies to Main Street USA? I think we could safely say that Microsoft has made, as an example, uh, being able to run a, a fairly sophisticated database an accessible technology through Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, they're doing very cool things now with SQL Server that uh, allow you to do uh, you know, always on configurations and do multiple instances of SQL Server on a single machine and high availability, high availability tools built in where you don't need a separate uh, storage area network. In fact, we have customers who are doing exactly that. They're taking Microsoft SQL Server and running many instances on a single machine and using the Microsoft HA that's built in. Now, there's no reason you couldn't do that on an open compute platform, and it might be exactly the right thing for a certain customer set to marry the uh, highly efficient, scalable hardware designs with the very familiar 
and battle-tested uh, Microsoft solutions. And then I think we, we mentioned briefly the point of the Microsoft announcement that I found particularly interesting is helping with some of the automation. So if we expect the average uh, administrator uh, around the world to be able to deploy these technologies, hardware and software included, we have to give them the tools to be able to manage dozens or potentially hundreds, maybe even at some scale, you know, thousands of servers at a time. And uh, if you look at what Microsoft does today in terms of standing up services with Azure, with Bing, with Skype, with you know, the whole rest of them, no they know how off, to do that. It's no skin off their Apple, so to speak, pun intended, <laughs> to to give them, give the hardware up because that's not their core competency. Right. And, but they have that core competency from an ops standpoint. And so what's their software angle? Is it going to be just classic enterprise software? Do you have any, any insight into that? Well, one of the things that they talk about just generally in the public is, uh, you know, I pay attention to their messaging around Azure and that uh, they want to deliver a set of technologies that customers could deploy on premise should they want to do that and they also want to have a similar set of tools available from a cloud services perspective with Azure. They want to be able to enable service providers to fill uh, a gap there as well. So one group of technology, I think they use the Microsoft One term to talk about technologies available for customer deployment, technologies available for service provider deployment, and technologies that Microsoft might make available as it, on its own as a SaaS service, and I just think that's a winning combination. You could carry it even further to say, wouldn't it be great if I as a customer was deploying a specified OCP configuration, Microsoft Azure was deploying the same specified OCP configuration, and I could know exactly what's happening with my SQL Server instance locally, and should I decide that I want to move that because the equipment is the same and the specs are the same, I know exactly what I'm going to get on the other side of the wire. Whether or not people do that is, is their choice, but I think that, that confidence level that can be delivered to uh, the world through those kind of discussions is, is impressive and something that we haven't had previously. So you've seen, some, Gary, seen some interesting, and I wonder if I get your opinion on this, interesting shifts in the server business, which for, for many years was kind of boring. Um, now you have the rise of the ODMs I mentioned today, the Matt Eastwood data that uh, I think 7% of the revenue is coming from ODMs, 12% of the volume. You saw IBM get out of the x86 business, which a lot of people said, okay, yeah, that's nice. It'll get IBM out of the low margin business, but it, it, but it's, it represents a, a, a quite a sea change in the dynamics of the server space. So what do you make of that shift that's going on? Help us squint through that. Well, I, I find it very exciting that uh, we're seeing new server architectures come to market that are getting tremendous adoption. Those are some of them coming from ODMs overseas directly, some of them coming through the Open Compute Foundation. Uh, it's certainly causing a shakeup in the industry. Now, we know that shakeups don't happen overnight, and I don't anticipate you know, some immediate you know, overnight flip where you know, everybody in every Fortune 5000 company is going to be uh, you know, changing their, their server acquisition strategies. But I do think it represents an opportunity for customers to, to have more choice uh, for how they want to pursue uh, the scale out of compute power. And I think it was uh, Andrew Feldman who said today that you know, all the interesting stuff, Andrew from uh, AMD was uh, uh, the founder of C-Micro, which AMD acquired. Uh, he said all the cool stuff happening these days with technology has a data center component. And so I'd say that for most U.S. Uh, businesses, and businesses around the world is not a U.S. specific comment, but for most global businesses, they're going to have to figure out uh, to what degree they want technology to be a part of that strategy, and if so, maybe take a hard look at what they've done historically for server acquisition, and does that need to change if they're going to need to scale their infrastructure at a certain point. Gary, I want to talk about culture. This show here represents to me a flashpoint of cultural intersection between hardware geeks, which have not been getting a lot of mainstream love lately from the press, uh, and, um, but us industry nerds know that, that you know, they make it all happen, and, you know, and we couldn't even highlight even better than the 30th anniversary of the Apple uh, Macintosh this past Saturday, um, to DevOps, right? So you're having this, and we even had Cumulus on, J.R. Rivers, you know, talking about bare metals back, I mean, never left the building, so to speak, as we said. Um, you have it all kind of coming together, and you got I.O. shipping containers of data centers, I.O. cloud, you guys are innovating inside everything. So, so this culture of DevOps is truly taking hold, and, 
and it's going mainstream. So the question is, talk about the culture, and is DevOps the same as, say, CloudOps? Because DevOps guys are eating glass, spitting out nails, uh, and they're almost like Navy SEALs in a, in a way, almost special forces of, of, of developers. Can that go mainstream? Or does it get you know, more I, I, neut neutralized? Well, I don't know if it gets neutralized, but I think there'll be different levels of, uh, of DevOps and how you manage servers at scale, and scale being number of servers and quantity of servers. So, you know, there's plenty of solutions that have been around for a long time. CF Engine, of course we have uh, Puppet and Chef, which are wonderful uh, automation tools. Uh, then there are tools, you know, sort of cloud in a box tools that, that do that all for you. And you could carry that all the way to what may come from Microsoft is, you know, what is the simplified interface for managing 100 servers at a time. <clears throat> all of those things are complementary and don't uh, necessarily negate one another. And I do believe that uh, once we, we're now at a point where we've crossed the barrier in terms of making the OCP platforms easy to understand and easy to acquire, the next big step will be can we make them uh, equally easy to manage? Gary, how about, um, I wonder if we could get a new, new title, CMO, so we like to ask the brand question. The, the evolution of the Fusion IO brand's been pretty interesting. I remember 2009, John, we are at one of these old, I think it was storage networking world or something, and thinking, that's pretty cool. And right around that time, EMC had announced the flash in the box kind mm -hmm. of approach, and wow, what, we've come a, quite a long way. But you guys pioneered that memory extension, obviously drove a lot of the hyperscale innovation, bleeding into the enterprise. Where do you see taking the Fusion IO brand going forward? What do you want it to stand for? So, at the big picture, we want to help customers scale their applications and application acceleration. Uh, at, our mission is to allow customers to run their applications faster with less infrastructure. And we do that across a variety of applications, could be database applications like Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, SAP HANA. We do it in virtualization environments like VMware and Hyper-V. We do it with VDI, and we do it with big data applications like MongoDB and Cassandra. All of these applications are mainstream in different areas of the market. And because Flash is a disruptive technology, we felt it very important that we take the time to educate our customers on the options that are available to them to deploy Flash and then work with our server OEM partners to make the deployment easy. <clears throat> so again, at a high level, it's about how do we make customers' infrastructure more efficient, faster applications, less infrastructure, a variety of applications, and then do it in conjunction with server partners uh, who can deliver the technology in a one-stop shop to our customers. The other thing that's expanded over the last couple of years with Fusion IO is that uh, customers want to deploy different Flash in different places, and that's great. So some customers might want to deploy Flash in the server, and that's a place that Fusion IO pioneered with our PCIe-based Flash memory products. Other customers might want a storage-centric approach, and we have those options through our IO control hybrid array and our ION data accelerator uh, all flash array. So those things make it easy now for customers to say, where should I deploy flash? Work with Fusion IO to say, how should I deploy it? And the, the options are all theirs. The bottom line for customers is the ability to increase the application performance and significantly reduce the cost. Okay, so that's, that's a ambitious sort of mission statement, if you will, not that that was a mission statement, but, but you laid out um, a lot of things for, for a lot of people. So what gives you confidence that you can sort of hit those marks? How are you feeling about you know, where you guys are at today and you know, going forward, how, how you're positioned? So this is a market that Fusion IO really jump-started in you know, 2007, we launched the technology. In 2008, we started shipping products uh, it was a, a you know, rocket ride over the last few years, and we're now participating in some of the largest deployments of Flash globally in both hyperscale companies and enterprise companies. But if you look at the spectrum of how these technologies are adopted, I still believe that we're in the early stages. When you go around to these kind of shows, we... Uh, Maybe OCP is probably a little bit on the leading edge of some of these, but at your average trade show, we still find far more people who have not deployed Flash in a significant mm. way 
than those who have deployed Flash in a significant way. And it's one of the things that gets me so excited about participating in both the OCP community, but also the larger data center infrastructure community and the application acceleration community is the opportunity we have to work with customers to make their applications run faster on less infrastructure. And so that is a, is a multi-year effort. Uh, there are still many, many untouched areas, untouched industries. You know, we have a few industries where I think we can claim they've been totally invented or reinvented. I think hyperscale and social media wouldn't exist without flash memory. I think that online advertising is, uh, is constantly being pointed to as a leading edge for technology adoption and flash. Streaming music, uh, you know, we recently last year announced Spotify as a Fusion IO customer. But there are so many industries that haven't deployed or don't have a company in that industry that has taken a leap to say I'm going to an all flash infrastructure. I just think there's a lot of room ahead. So Gary, wanna, I want to ask you the final question. Your take on open compute, where do you see it going? Obviously a lot of groping for market position. At the same time, it's still a clean sheet of paper if you think about it. Um, you see some vendors here, unlike last year, you got Boots here, you had some folks here. What's your take on that? I mean, you know, yeah. how do you see the community evolving? We heard from Colin earlier, he's putting it right up front. We're transparent, we're lean, we're mean, we're not, we're not going to be driven by the dollar, we're driven by contribution, which is great to hear. Um, how do you see all this evolving? You know, in the span of just a couple of years, this organization has gone from an idea to a movement. And you can sense it in the comments from the speakers and the reaction from the crowd that there is a collective sense of purpose. And, you know, once you have people bring, coming together with a common sense of purpose, I think it, it does lead to some pretty spectacular things. Uh, a couple of years ago, you know, you, you really had to be a, a server expert and know every last bit of detail if you wanted to participate in OCP. Now you can call a uh, one-stop shop like Hive Solutions or Quanta and get a full or multiple OCP racks delivered to your doorstep. I think what we'll see now is more participants both on the supplier side and the customer side, more designs. Uh, the Frank mentioned today the certification program where they want to you know, certify specific configurations. I didn't get all the details there, but you know, wouldn't it be interesting if those actually specify the application workload as well so you could know that out of the box I'm going to get this well orchestrated and tuned MySQL configuration across 16 or 32 nodes and I can spin it up and it'll have the management capabilities right there to just be off and running with a, a high powered MySQL database. So those things are not far away, it's just going to take the collective energy of this already well fueled group to make that happen and I think you know, if I were to make a prediction about next year, watch the OCP configurations get more uh, they'll always remain open, uh, but be more integrated and more tied and specific to application workloads that ultimately make it easier for a customer to say, yeah, the, I want to deploy that's that. That's that notion, John, of that single managed entity that Floyer was talking about, the SME. I mean, and then, Gary, you're talking about solutions that also address workload specificity, right. which I think is compulsory for success here. We always like to ask executives that come on theCUBE, especially alumni, <laughs> secret questions at the end, they're unprepared for, um, not that we prepare any questions in advance, the teleprompter's <laughs> broken again for the fourth year, Dave, uh, here in theCUBE. Um, Smashed. <laughs> uh, no teleprompters, that's you know, inside joke. Um, Gary, I got to ask you your opinion on Bitcoin. Oh, um, <laughs> I'm trying to get up to speed on it, but I've been so busy preparing for all this stuff with OCP. I, you know, I think it's fascinating and uh, I still don't understand all the intricacies of it, but um, so you know, it, to me, any time you can take friction out of commerce and friction out of payments, it it generally leads to more activity and hopefully positive activity. You know, I've, the the thing that's easier for me to understand is Square, which really has made. Uh, payments frictionless, you know, you get home, take a taxi late at night, they send you the receipt, the whole thing's done, you don't have to do anything. And I think we're going to see Bitcoin become a platform on which people can build some of these very seamless services for payments where the payments process and the payments transaction becomes invisible, which will only lead to more payments. And so. they're building on OCP, right? 
Well, we, today. you know, there's a lot of inside baseball. The early Bitcoin miners were guys who had these big exchange hosters were mining early and often made a boatload of cash. So, you know, Bitcoin is not a foreign entity to a lot of these big OCP players. You talk to any of the guys who know about infrastructure and networking, they can know they probably arbitrage a little bit of that Bitcoin. Um, but, uh, you know, Mark Andreessen wrote a great article in the New York yeah. Times. Um, which essentially mirrored my editorial from weeks earlier oh, when, I did a video, when, I did a video, <laughs> when I did a video post on SiliconANGLE. Um, and it was on the same thread. This is a future, it's about a future paradigm, not so much the yeah. nuances of Bitcoin. Uh, I talked to some folks in some big banks. It's politically incorrect to, to answer, no, we will not accept Bitcoin. Everybody, I mean, everyone is saying, we will, we're looking at Bitcoin. Right. It's kind of like a venture capitalist. They'll never say no, but they don't always say yes. Right. So um, Bitcoin is still yet to be judged, but more and more evidence is coming down. Um, I always said it's all about the clearinghouse, who's going to be holding the, are you sitting in a chair when the music stops? Right. That's what everyone <laughs> wants to know about Bitcoin. Is it a bubble? Who's going to be holding the hot potato when the music stops? That's always... <laughs> <laughs> Always case. Gary, great to have you back. Thanks, for, thanks for having uh, us. CMO of Fusion.io, continue on a torrid pace. Um, guys, great success story in the industry here at the, in the center of all the action uh, for Open Compute Summit. This is a technology revolution, changing the game uh, for the next generation. This is theCUBE. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.